As I walked into the beautiful Arcadia School, it was as if I was transported in time, and I was a kid again. I met all the young children running around, and I enjoyed playing with them and connecting with them. This beautiful school was a lovely, idyllic setting for our chat. Naveel Vanrani loves education, and he's a great believer in learning, changing lives. He's bringing his well-honed business acumen to Arcadia School now. Naveen also oversees 10 companies, 6 joint ventures and 5,000 employees as the CEO of Al Sharawi Engineering Services Group and he's also a board member. Today he will tell us all about Arcadia. We will look into learning how to learn. Naveen himself has a blue-blooded education pedigree. He's a graduate from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, and an MBA from London Business School. Now he's living his dream and building a great legacy through learning and changing lives. I feel like a child. I am a child at heart, and today has given me an opportunity to just immerse myself in my, in my young days. And, uh, we're delighted to be here at the Arcadia Preparatory School and we are here with the CEO, Naveen Valrani. Naveen, welcome. It's a wonderful thing. Thank Real you. Privilege. Thank you, Tarek. Thank you for inviting us here. And I'm so happy to invite us because I'm, I'm almost lost. Uh, I, I, don't want, I, I want to go and play with the kids rather than be here with you. <laughs> so you've got to make it fun. You have serious competition now. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> no, I'm sure you will. Now, uh, Naveen, this, is, this seems like a... A, a dream project. This seems like a heart-based project. Where did it come from and what's th what are the thoughts behind it? So the project was very much initiated by the chairman of the school, uh, my father Mohan Walrani, and this uh, was always going to be his legacy project. Mm -hmm. So right from the name of the school to where it was going to be located mm -hmm. to the procurement of the land parcel uh, to the building of the school and now of course to the delivery of the curriculum to our children it was all he's been involved in every single step of the way I came on board relatively recently I came on board of um, in uh, March of 2016 uh, I was honored that uh, my father and the other shareholders uh, looked upon me as the to be you know to head this place as the CEO and I just love it, you know, I come here every day and it is really uh, the highlight yeah. of, of, my, of my typical day. Yeah. It keeps you grounded, doesn't it? Because I'm a very serious person, but I'm very childlike. I'm not childish, I'm childlike. And I love that, that their ability to be curious and, and they just make friends instantly and, and, and so on and as we were playing downstairs. Do you feel like that? Does it take you back to your childhood every day? It does, uh, but there's also uh, the, the bigger picture, yeah, yeah, and it's really about the ethos of the school. <laughs> and you know, our, our ethos is uh, nurture lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. And really for us, it's about providing that nurturing environment, which will allow uh, ch our children who are here at the school to, uh, to love to learn. Yes. And really it's all about that and, and as a result we've created a very very happy school yeah. whether it's um, happy teachers, happy, uh, ha happy principal, happy deputy and of course happy children. Happy, happy parents. And happy parents. Because I think they play, play an integral part in, in terms of the stakeholder community. Yes they do. Yeah. They do. Uh, one of the phrases that I use uh, and I will probably be killed for this but says end of education long live learning and you've hit the nail on the head, it's about the future of learning. And we talk about learning how to learn. Is that really the, the, the core of what you, do to, uh, you are imparting to these young children about the ability to learn critical thinking, memory, comprehension, to prepare them for the future? Yes, and it's really about creating a love for learning. Uh, learning uh, is a lifelong process as you and I both know and you know both of us enjoy enjoy learning <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and and really it is to create that love for learning 
that no matter in what context you are or what experience you're facing, there's always a learning that one can take out of it. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily have to be in a formal environment. Sure. A lot of our learning happens in informal environments, yeah. and that's really what this school is all about. Yeah. Whether it's in the corridors, whether it's in the dining hall, in the, uh, whether it's in our coffee shop, whether it's, uh, whether it's in the multi-purpose hall where the children are playing, the learning can happen anywhere. A lot of the, the, the reading that I have done, and I work closely with one of my mentors, which is Professor Tony Buzan, who is uh, the inventor of mind mapping and, and all things learning and all things innovation and creativity. And one of the key things that we talk about is that kids are born geniuses. We send them to school to dumb them down. <laughs> and by the time they graduated, they really come down to about 10% of their creativity and curiosity. How are you ensuring that they don't get dumbed down? So I think, the, you know, when you look at the education space, I don't think there is any other uh, area in our in our global economy that is as ripe for disruption as education mm -hmm. it is changing very rapidly and the model of delivery uh, is also changing very rapidly and this goes right the way from the early years mm -hmm. all the way through to university level mm -hmm. um, the online space is making a real real impact and learning in the traditional sense when you and I went to school yeah. uh, is no longer applicable in today's global context mm -hmm. because children and parents can sit at home and get the same content online yeah. as, 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 as schools are planning to impart. So really where schools play a role, and there is some experimentation already happening on this mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in, a, in the United States in a much more formal manner, mm -hmm. But where schools play a role is when the child comes into school, yes, the academic learning is there, but it's also about the other things. It's about having fun. It's about the social interaction. Mm -hmm. It's about uh, you know, sharing and living those moments. Mm -hmm. uh, it could even be about watching a, a, an educational or a learning uh, a TV show mm -hmm. or, or, or a movie. Uh, and really, that's what really Arcadia is all about. That for the majority of us of our generation growing up the generation Y you know it was like oh no the first day of school and the f and and uh, uh, those blues the <laughs> night before that oh it's the first day but what we strive to achieve here is that we want our children to love to come to school and one of the things you'll see our, our leadership team and our teachers constantly asking our children is do you want to go home <laughs> uh, just to, to to ensure and that's sort of more a, a feedback to us that look are they really enjoying themselves yes. because it's very very important to truly cherish your school experience yeah. and it's only that that enjoyment that will lead to this appreciation yeah. of learning so in the classic uh, genre of movies, let's do a flashback of mm -hmm. your life mm -hmm. and how it started and where we at, we've ended today. Mm -hmm. um, so when you think about your childhood, uh, were you a naughty child? I actually wasn't. Uh, <laughs> I was uh, uh, quite a good boy. Okay. Uh, as, as I entered into the teen years, I uh, was a little naughty, mm -hmm. uh, but nothing to the extent that I could have been. <laughs> Um, but uh, no, by and large, you know, I was always trying to, to be that model child. Absolutely. Who inspired you in your early days, um, from your family or from outside? Uh, was there somebody who just literally helped you to be the catalyst? In my early days, it was uh, definitely my father. Mm -hmm. And uh, till this day, he continues to be an amazing source of inspiration. Mm -hmm. Leaving aside the fact that you know he was my father, and, and many sons of the world look up to their dads, Absolutely. but he was the quintessential business person, mm -hmm. uh, traveling the world, setting up offices globally, and truly uh, building a, a what is now today the Al Shirawi Group. Mm -hmm. uh, so I always uh, looked at his. Uh, his style of doing business, always listened in, uh, in on his conversations, uh, and he was, you know, he's, he was and is just truly a remarkable man. And is that the, the true sort of uh, uh, apprenticeship uh, that you, you got? Uh, because a lot of people miss out on 
what I call apprenticeship, learning, and how to become an artisan that you may have become today. Yes, but I also got a few lucky breaks along the way okay. um, that have uh, contributed to uh, to where I am today. Mm -hmm. um, one of them was uh, my um, uh, my A level year. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to Dubai College, and uh, I was a reasonably good student. I wouldn't say I was a great student until I got to my A levels, and. During my A-levels, there was an economics teacher, Mr. Hobday. Okay. Uh, I've tried to trace him since then, uh, but I haven't managed to make contact. But Mr. Hobday, one day, uh, came to class, and I don't know what he saw in me, but he said, Naveen, today you will teach the class. <laughs> and it was the most odd request yes. in, a, in a very formal British school in those days. Right. Um, and I got up and uh, taught the class and it gave me a wave of confidence. Uh, I later went on to win the economics prize, you know, the annual prize giving. Right. And I think that was probably the one the most critical factor in getting me to what was my dream school, mm -hmm. the Wharton School of Business, part yes. of the University of Pennsylvania. Yeah. And, and, and from then on, I never looked back, you know, right. uh, professors, faculty, you know, they all played a role in this journey. Yeah. So that was an epiphany, and it's interesting that you mention a teacher because most of us remember a great teacher, Correct. like we remember our father as a mentor. So True. wonderful story. True. Thank you for that. So fast forward into your business life. Uh, did you actually ever go and apply for a job? I mean, did you have to write your CV or just walked into a job somewhere? So I did prepare a CV uh, in my college years. Yeah. Uh, you know, being in the Warden School of Business, there was always that that sort of dream that you know that I should be part of that finance world. It yeah. looks so appealing on the outside. Um, but I um, and along the way, I did internships. Mm -hmm. So I was exposed to um, to the real world yeah. uh, as as a college student. But uh, in my ongoing conversations with my father. Um, you know, as I was graduating, he's, you know, we, we both agreed mm -hmm. that, you know, I should come back. Mm -hmm. uh, and I loved uh, the fact that I could be at home. Mm -hmm. I could be in this wonderful city of Dubai. Yeah. And uh, at the same time, uh, be in a city that I, that, that I kind of suspected mm -hmm. would, would had the potential to transform itself. Mm -hmm. And uh, there would obviously be a, a huge upside to that. You lived your life through this transformation that happened in Dubai. Correct. So your, your career and your life was a parallel to how this country was growing also. True. Could you just give, share some of uh, your early days in business? Was it, were you more entrepreneurial or you had a very technical role? So, you know, I had a business education yes. uh, and I was put into an engineering space mm -hmm. uh, and it was, uh, it was challenging. Uh, for many who are, you know, who viewed me coming in as this 21-year-old boy, mm -hmm. uh, it was like, you know, he's the senior vice chairman's son. <laughs> so there was automatically a sense of false respect yeah. that was given. And really, this was probably the biggest challenge early on that I had to overcome because mm -hmm. I knew that if I truly wanted to be respected as a leader, mm -hmm. I needed to prove myself. Yeah. So while I, I was given a relatively senior role in the organization, it, you know, I always worked with the philosophy that I was working for my team and then it wasn't the other way around. Yes. And I constantly had to prove myself in order to be then respected to eventually be the CEO of the organization. Is that, uh, has been, is that been your way of approaching uh, your business and your development of your career, is actually serving your team and in return, helping to grow? Yes, it has. And, uh, and, and, you know, for someone who's graduated from Wharton in the early 90s, this is probably quite surprising. <laughs> yes. uh, it doesn't fit the stereotypical image of a Wharton, uh, and a Wharton, a Wharton graduate. <laughs> yes. but, but my favorite courses in college were actually outside of the Wharton School. So they were at the College of Arts and Sciences. Right. And one of the best um, one of the best courses I took was actually a religious studies course and in the in the thesis paper that we had to write uh, I actually wrote about Gandhi and and for me uh, Gandhi's philosophy of serving uh, serving a nation 
played uh, just a tremendous role. You know, I did a lot of reading yeah. on Gandhi and I came back here with that mentality that I had to serve. Yeah. And till this day, that is my ethos. Brilliant. Your journey in terms of your business and your career development, um, one of the key things that we, we always marvel at is companies that are able to scale and grow at an exponential pace. What's your secret of that? How did you do that? I think, uh, firstly, uh, I had the toolkit, mm -hmm. so I had a great education. Yeah. Uh, I also had this love for lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. uh, I went back to university at the age of 40, mm -hmm. which wasn't too long ago. I did my executive MBA at London Business School. And really, that sort of reinvigorated uh, my, my entire thinking. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're doing your executive MBA at the age of 40, you're by definition around people, mm -hmm. fellow students who yes. are ambitious. Yeah. And, ambition, and ambition is very, very contagious. Yeah. Uh, and um, so scale was something that was, uh, came to me naturally. Mm -hmm. uh, the other day I had a, a, a colleague of mine uh, tell me that, Naveen, why don't you slow down? Mm -hmm. Why don't you take it easy you know? mm -hmm. you've, it's you know you've you've achieved what you've done right. uh, wh what you had to do and I said the day the day I have to stop growing my organizations mm -hmm. is the day I stop being a leader and uh, really growth and scale uh, by definition is what uh, CEOs uh, are employed to do a great answer, but I think one of the things that we do is that, let, let's say you started in the mid-90s in about 20 to 25 years. How big was your first balance sheet that you were looking after? And how, big, how much bigger is it now? That's the exponential shift that I'm talking about. Yeah. So if you had a top-line revenue of $10 million then, and it's a billion dollars today, how do you scale that? And, and how do you drive that? I think that is a, what a lot of people find extremely interesting, particularly in a, in a business, uh, in, a, in an organization rather than just pure crazy entrepreneurship. So firstly, in terms of data, uh, I was given the, what is known as the engineering services cluster of companies yeah. in 1997 by my chairman and my senior vice chairman. And at that time we were, the, our turnover was roughly 40 million dirhams. Mm -hmm. Today, that same it's pretty group, close. Uh, <laughs> it's it ten is, million dollars. It is pretty close. <laughs> and today, that same group turns over one and a half billion dirhams. Right. Uh, and really, what what has happened in this journey? Uh, and this might seem like a very stereotypical answer, but firstly, it is it is the people. Uh, you know, I have had the good fortune of being around some wonderful managers mm -hmm. uh, who are leaders in their own sense yeah. and have grown with me. Uh, but, but you selected those people and you, you nurtured those people. True. So I think that's part of it. So is that the secret that you have great people around you and therefore you accelerate at an exponential rate? It's part of it, but it's also the philosophy, uh, I believe, of the, of the leader. Uh, for me, and again, I go back to this Gandhian philosophy mm -hmm. of serving. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd never ever, till this day, look at myself as their boss. Mm -hmm. Uh, in fact, I detest the word employee. <laughs> uh, I, I, I can't even say it. Yeah, you know, I, I, mean, I use I, the word I, colleague. Always. I, yeah, yes. I, I hesitate to say <laughs> yes. it because uh, for me, we're one team. Yes. We, we're, we have one purpose. Okay. And, uh, and really, that's, that's really been the central ethos of, of, of my entire being when it comes to my professional, professional yeah. career. So let's go back. Uh, 40 million dirhams to 1.5 billion. How do you do that? Okay, the first and foremost is you need to have ambition. Mm -hmm. You need to truly believe that you can grow this business. Mm -hmm. And one should not be limited by a given city. We've been very blessed that we're in this wonderful city of Dubai mm -hmm. with a leadership that has provided us with so many opportunities. Yeah. But the world is much bigger than Dubai. Mm -hmm. And opportunities come up across the region uh, and across the globe. We just recently opened uh, an office in New York City, mm, uh, an office uh, that does chiller service, mm -hmm. uh, and we've, we've already started revenueing there. 
Uh, now, if someone had told me, uh, you know, th uh, 25 years ago that, Naveen, uh, you're going to open an office in New York City mm -hmm. and compete with service organizations in what is arguably the most competitive city in the world, mm -hmm. I would say, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. But you've got to be constantly open for opportunities. Mm -hmm. And they, they come knocking on your door. Yeah. Uh, and as long as you have an open mind, yeah. uh, and, and, and you know, the rest will follow. Sure. What sort of disciplines and methodology did you have as you were going through the development of your life and, and development of your business and your team around you? Was there a, a method and a process that you were applying that you could replicate? We're looking for inspiration, we're looking for your thought leadership. How, how did you do it? Perhaps we can learn from that. The one thing, firstly, in terms of personal habits is, uh, is discipline. Mm -hmm. um, I always believe in coming to work on time. Mm -hmm. And uh, apart from a blip uh, where I had to have a surgery in 97, uh, I don't think I've ever taken sick leave. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, you know, <laughs> touch wood. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, 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 you know, I try and keep healthy, mm -hmm. and I think it's important to be, you know, to, to take care of yourself. Yeah. Uh, I keep some time aside every day to reflect, mm -hmm. uh, and and really, I leave uh, I leave home every day with the, the thought that I need to come back at the end of this day and feel that I've made a difference in someone's life. Mm -hmm. uh, apart from that, the, you know, these personal habits, uh, learning has played a huge role. Mm -hmm. I, you know, as I told you, I did my master's, mm -hmm. my MBA at 40, yes. uh, but I plan to go back to school uh, you next should. year you should. and do my second master's, uh, this time <laughs> in education. Okay. Um, because you know, I, I, I feel I learn best in a classroom environment right. uh, and I'm happiest in a classroom environment. May I, may I give a little suggestion? Uh, take, take poetry, uh, take art, as part of your, your study, uh, your curriculum? In fact, poetry, you know, I, 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 I enjoy writing. Yeah. I maintain a blog. And uh, when it came to poetry, the last time I wrote poetry was when I was dating my, my wife. Okay. Uh, so, I, you know, I was based in the United States. Yeah. She was in Nigeria. Uh, and there was no email, <laughs> uh, and letters and you know, phone calls were very expensive, at least, right. when, at least when you're on a student budget. This is true. <laughs> and uh, really, letters were the only way we used to communicate with yeah. each other, so I used to write her poems. So is th that's how you, you wooed her, and, <laughs> and she became your wife. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think maybe it did play a role. <laughs> maybe that's the secret. People should write poetry, that's how they're good. But look at, look, get look at our, our ruler, uh, yeah. you know, what, a, what an excellent poet. Indeed, and poet philosopher kings, are in, or even in Greek mythology, considered the supreme leaders. And, and because you have that softer side and your balance, because poetry is, is actually called the, the synthesis, the, the, the royal jelly of thinking, because all aspects of your brain come together and they just synthesize into a phrase or a word or a meaning. Yeah, so, it's beautiful. So that is what poetry does. It, it, it basically helps your plethora of your, your experiences and your knowledge to be synthesized in a phrase or in a paragraph. It does. It's, it's, it's very therapeutic. It's very therapeutic, but it's, it's, it's a great learning process. I mean, since you are a student of learning and, and helping young children learn, what an amazing way to, to write poetry. Uh, the other one is art expression of art. Yes. Um, I've never been a good artist, to be which honest. Which is actually, ask a little child downstairs, all the 400, 100, 200 students here, are they good artists? All of them are good artists. <laughs> Somewhere down the line, true. you drop the ball. True, true. <laughs> very, very true. Very, very so true. So all you need to do is basically come to one of these little kids' art classes and, you know, roll up your sleeves and dive in. And trust me, you're an artist true. at heart. True, true. <laughs> I think we all are. Yeah, absolutely. In your life, what were your biggest challenges? I mean, genuine challenges, not you know, the stereotypical ones that are... But did you actually hit a bump on the road? Did you feel like, oh my God, I'm stuck? And then how did you find your way out? So in terms of challenges, you know, the first thing that came to mind instinctively when you, when you said challenges was actually when I wanted to marry my wife. <laughs> okay. You know, I graduated from college at the age of 21, yeah. very much in love. Yeah. 
and uh, we were long distance. Right. So I had to figure out a way to marry her <laughs> okay. in order to be with her. Yeah. So, uh, so really what I did uh, instinctively was work really, really hard. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, really the, uh, 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 and then was able to go to my parents and say, you know, I want to make this, this move. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of hitting a bump, the biggest bump I hit was in 97, okay. where I was given this role of looking after engineering services mm -hmm. and uh, uh, knew, didn't know the first thing about air conditioning or uh, electrical and, or plumbing or waterproofing. Yeah. And at the same time, uh, I felt very ill and maybe they were related mm -hmm. uh, with, the, you know, with the stress. And it was, I, was, I was out for about uh, a good three to four months mm -hmm. uh, and you know, just didn't know what, to hit, you know what hit me. My wife was also pregnant mm -hmm. with our first, uh, first child. Mm -hmm. So it was like everything happening together. Here I am given this huge responsibility with this weight of expectation. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that, that sense of expectation built up right the way from a child to yeah. being, you know, being at university, getting into a great school and you come back and suddenly you ha everyone has this expectation. So, so was that uh, living up to people's expectations one of your, your sense of personal responsibility that you were always aspiring to and trying to fulfill? True, true. And it's, uh, uh, you know, typically uh, uh, teenagers and, and, and people in their 20s and 30s, uh, there's always trying to meet we're always trying to meet expectations. And I think that's why, where the 40s play such a critical role. So were you living your life or were you living people's expectation of what your life should look like? I, I, you know, that's a very good question. And I would probably say it's the latter. Right. Uh, you know, I, I, I was uh, living a, a life that people expected me to live. Yeah. Uh, and as a result, you know, we talked about this earlier, this, yes. this perfection, yes. uh, or this, this strive towards perfection. Yeah. Uh, that was always, uh, always very, very important to me. Which is what I'm intuitively picking up is that you got under stress because you were put in a, an environment where you were completely out of your comfort zone in terms of Correct. learning. So you seem like the sort of person who's really hard on, on yourself. Is yeah, I am. I am. <laughs> so because you have such high standards, yeah. so you're very tough on yourself. What advice do you give to people who are out there looking for jobs, looking for opportunities? Should they also be as tough on themselves and fall sick, or should they just chill? <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, I wouldn't go with either extreme. <laughs> That's why I've asked you the difficult question. <laughs> I think, you know, and, and, you know, I apply this even in raising my own children. Right. I think it's important to firstly pursue what you enjoy, regardless of the financial rewards. Right. When we were young, uh, you know, I didn't grow up saying, I'm going to sell air conditioners one day. Right. Um, so I think it's really important to nurture those early dreams yeah. and as parents and educators we have that responsibility yeah. to sort of take those ideas of our younger children and, and really nurture them as they grow, yeah. grow older. Yeah. Uh, and I think that will truly lead to happiness. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't uh, uh, go the route that I went of imposing this, this, these expectations on yourself and being hard on yourself. Yeah. But at the same time, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't relax uh, either and say, you know, let's just chill. Uh, I think we all have a responsibility to make a difference. How, how tough are you on your children in terms of expectation? If, if I was speaking to your young 18, 19 year old son, would he turn around and say, I'm doing this because I love my dad and my dad would feel really, really proud if I did this? I think by default I'm tough mm -hmm. because of the kind of life I lead. Sure. So, you know, when it comes to leading by example, they look up to me and they say, you know, dad's getting A's at, and he's 45 or he's getting <laughs> A stars, you know, we should be able to get this. Um, but. Uh, I think to, to a certain extent I've achieved what I was talking about earlier. So my elder son, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, he's, surprise, surprise. he's, <laughs> he's studying uh, philosophy, politics and economics, okay. you know, PPE. So Absolutely. he's, read, he's yeah. reading and he's going down this intellectual pathway, yes. uh, unlike, say, myself, and it was, you know, who went down a business road and it was all about, you know, I wanted to be in a business school. Yeah. 
so he's he's taking his own path. So if he loses his way in the traditional form of mm -hmm. what how people see things, and he comes out and says that. I love this philosophy thing and I'm just like going to write a book, be an author, travel the world and basically not play the, the, the usual uh, business or career job role. What would you say? What would you think? I would, you know, honestly, I would love him for it. Great. I would love him for it, you know, because uh, even now, you know, I spoke to him last night on Skype. Uh, even now, uh, I just love the fact that he's enjoying what he's doing and he's loving what he's doing. And, uh, you know, dad and granddad have worked hard. Yeah. Uh, granddad has made a tremendous amount of sacrifice. Dad's made a little bit of sacrifice. But you don't need to go down that road, you know. Focus on happiness. Focus on on remembering those moments mm -hmm. of, you know, your high school dance mm -hmm. or your first girlfriend or your, uh, you know, the moment that you, uh, you, you met someone that truly was a mentor that had an impact in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really what matters. Yeah, because I've, I've spoken to a lot of very successful people and one of the key questions I ask is how do you keep that sense of balance and to be centered uh, for a young child who's grown up in a very comfortable environment? How do you give them the essence of Dude, you've got to work hard to make this thing happen in your life. It's not just going to be on a plate. Yes, I'm always there. You've got to get your own act together. Yeah, I mean, my son, my elder son, uh, he was, you know, he wanted to go to the University of Pennsylvania. He's been going there since he was 11. You know, I've been taking him, yeah, yeah. taking him there. So he very much wanted to go to UPenn. And there was a time, I think it was in his junior year of high school, where he, he told me, he said, Dad, I might not get the grades. Yeah. And... We were at the dinner table mm -hmm. and I said, you know, I looked at him and I said, no matter what, we will still love you. <laughs> sure. You know, it's yeah. not the be all to end all. Yeah. Of course, he ended up getting the grades and he ended up going to his dream school. But I think it's very important for parents to play a balancing role. If a child is being very hard on himself, they have to always give them the sense of security that it's okay to fail yeah. and we'll all be around. And if it's the other way around where the child is not working hard and not putting in the effort, then, then I think uh, a, a little bit more, uh, not a tougher line, but a more, a more rigid line needs to be taken. Going back to your business space and your business experiences that we can uh, work, we can share. Um, you've hired hundreds and hundreds of people. What are the true qualities that you're looking for when your CD arrives in your desk? What are you looking for? You know, it's difficult to judge someone just by a CV. And I think the person-to-person -person interaction is very, very important. Uh, today, of course, I recruit at the very senior level. And there really has to be a sense of chemistry uh, between, let's say, myself and, and the person I'm recruiting uh, at, at a senior leadership level. Over the years, you know, I've recruited at, at, at all levels. And uh, um, initially, from, from a CV perspective, uh, what 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 really matters to me is is there some element of seriousness in this particular individual's academic path mm -hmm. and then in the person-to-person -person interview mm -hmm. it really for me comes down to values mm -hmm. we have certain values that we do not compromise on for instance uh, equality in the workplace mm -hmm. regardless of race religion mm -hmm. caste gender uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, be we believe that uh, individuals should progress based on merit. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we're very, very particular about is how, how individuals view women in the workplace. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is women as, as well. Yeah, yeah. So when we're recruiting males and females, yeah. uh, this is, this is uh, at least for me, this is a, a discussion that I, that I have. Yeah. When I walked in uh, onto this floor, this beautiful environment, one of the first signs was if you haven't failed, you haven't really tried hard enough. Uh, and a picture of Steve Jobs right next to it. You know, it is from my playbook, basically. This is what I keep, <laughs> because I fail regularly. Unlike you, you succeed regularly. I fail regularly and I learn and I, and I bounce forward. I don't bounce back, I bounce forward. So the question was that you, you get a CV and people have fallen and risen and fallen and learned. When you get a CV like that, what do you look at? And what are the kinds of questions that go through your head? So some of our best managers have been those that have run their own businesses 
and failed and actually folded mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. declared bankruptcy. Right. Um, we recently hired an individual who uh, started his career uh, in um, he started his business career, his entrepreneur, uh, entrepreneurship career in Iraq. Mm -hmm. He went to Iraq, to, to the north. Everybody was talking about Iraq a few years ago mm -hmm. and said, you know, um, Erbil is the next Dubai. You know, there's a lot of building happening there. And he started his career there, started a business there, literally a few months before Iraq just collapsed. Mm -hmm. So the poor chap had to fold his business because of safety reasons, mm -hmm. and then moved over to Qatar, which was the next talked about place. Mm -hmm. He got into a partnership in Qatar that where uh, he was ended up becoming more a hostage to the partner. Mm -hmm. You know, as you know, you know, he needed an exit visa to leave and stuff. So then again had to fold and uh, ended up in Dubai, where he worked for a company which where, who you know appointed him as a partner and uh, didn't get his salary on time mm -hmm. and i came across this individual who's failed three times mm -hmm. and i hired him i hired him because when he was telling me his story which initially started off with a little bit of humor mm -hmm. but then as, as he went on i began to understand the gravity of the situations that he had been through and i said you know this particular individual will truly be someone that can make an impact and make a difference. So when you looked into the whites of his eyes, what did you see? What was that essence of that? I saw a determination to prove to the world that he can do it. And, and I just needed to provide the platform mm -hmm. with which he could prove, prove himself. So that's the value that you respected? Yes. Really. It gives me a nice segue into uh, jobs versus entrepreneurship when you look at a young person what do you recommend in terms of recommendation i would say it's important although i didn't personally do this uh, to start your career in a job i think it's important to have a boss and to have that discipline yes that, yeah, and that right. truly brings discipline and i think discipline is extremely important mm -hmm. uh, so start your career in a, in a job being an entrepreneur may look very good on the outside mm -hmm but it is an extremely stressful profession. Uh, having to know that you need to pay salaries on time every month is not a easy burden to carry. And you're the last one to get it, if at all. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so uh, be careful before stepping into the world of, of entrepreneurs. Uh, yes, we all admire Steve Jobs and Mark Zuckerberg and Bill Gates. But these particular individuals really worked hard yes. and really sacrificed. Yes. The reason I'm asking this question is that we're going through an, the fourth revolution of automation and stuff, and the world's shifting. So, that, so we are f facing a jobless future. We're facing a future where there'll be fewer and fewer jobs because machines can do it. How resilient and versatile can people be what are your thoughts and your, your possible advice to these young people? We're, we're heading into a very, very difficult world. Uh, and this change of social contract goes beyond just artificial intelligence and robots replacing jobs. It also, the, you know, intertwined with that is this life of ours that is now increasing. So the person who's going to live to 200 Absolutely. is already born today. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I read a very interesting book uh, recently called The Hundred Year Life by two London Business School professors. And um, really, everything is going to change. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that if we're living to 100, mm -hmm. which is a, a realistic possibility uh, uh, for, for both you and I, yes. if we're going to live to 100, it means if the, if the, if the retirement age remains at 65, mm -hmm. We have another 35 years mm -hmm. to now firstly support ourselves mm -hmm. and, and our significant others. Uh, we also have 35 years with our partners. Mm -hmm. Now 35 years is a long, long time. Sure. So potentially 
you know, we're going to have, see changes in the divorce rates. We're going to see changes in in uh, in pension funds. We're going to see, you know, this everything is up for change right now. And governments are not acknowledging this challenge. Mm -hmm. Now, as an individual who's today young and, and and graduating, and you know, how do you how do you deal with this world? It's something we touched upon earlier, and it's about lifelong learning. Mm -hmm. One has to continuously retrain themselves. Mm -hmm. One has to specialize. So, you know, the business graduate who knew a little bit of accounting, a little bit of finance, a little bit of this, that's not going to work in this world of tomorrow. Actually, the, one of the words that I use is we have to end up becoming artisans. Exactly. Ex beyond even experts, we, bec we have something which we are so perfect at, uh, as an artisan would be. Yeah. yeah, and this is where I think vocational schools yes. will play such a big role. Mm -hmm. And this is where governments who have historically uh, sort of focused on these degrees mm -hmm. you know do you have a bachelor's do you have a master's yeah. will have to shift their thinking yeah. into what trades are you specialized in mm -hmm. you know are you a great welder yeah. are you uh, you know are you uh, are you are you uh, a, a, an amazing technician who can fix driverless cars mm -hmm. uh, are, you, are you someone that will that will maintain the, our, our contact lenses in future it's going to get really, really specialized, and yeah. we have to continuously retrain ourselves. And the education sector will, 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 will start offering these sort of trades. Yeah. So since you are in the education sector, should we dump the degree uh, structure at the moment? Um, three to four year degree programs? Should we just do a one year degree program for academic learning and three years of tinkering and making mistakes and evolving ourselves and developing ourselves? Is that the shift that's coming about? The shift is coming about. So if you look at uh, INSEAD, very, very good business school in Europe, uh, they, their MBA is one year. It has been so for, for a while now. Mm -hmm. London Business School has introduced a series of one-year pr programs at the master's level. Mm -hmm. uh, schools, schools are now, are, are, as I said, ripe for disruption. In, in the United States, they've introduced a concept known as flip schools. Mm -hmm where you do, you come to school just to do homework. Okay, interesting. <laughs> and all the actual learning yeah. takes place at home. Right, <laughs> flip school. So, so so that's the first for me. Flipped they they, they yeah. flipped it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so there's going to be a lot of changes. Um, should we go out and dump our degrees? This will be a gradual process, but it will happen. Right. It will happen, homeschooling. Absolutely, absolutely. I came across a wonderful student uh, who I was advising recently uh, for university admission who had been homeschooled for the last six years mm -hmm. and she in every single GCSE she took mm -hmm. she got an A star okay. including the number one in the UAE for her examination board right. for sociology she got an award okay. she was homeschooled mm -hmm. so education is ripe uh, is, is changing. It's changing and as schools and as educators we have to be aware of that. Yeah. A couple of, uh, sort of bugbears for me personally and that's why I'd like to share them with you and get your thoughts on that. Um, looking at the word MBA, Masters of Business Administration, isn't administration very yesterday? Shouldn't it be Masters of Business Learning or Masters of Business Thinking? So slight shift in the curriculum but a big shift in the way we see stuff, in the way we engage with our careers in the future. I need to be a business thinker, not an administrator. Would you agree with that? True. And I think uh, uh, universities and business schools across the world are recognizing this. Mm -hmm. So again, in London Business School, you have what is uh, a program known as a MIM, uh, Masters in, in Management. The administration is gone. Mm -hmm. MIF, Masters in Finance. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, MIFA, Ma Masters in Financial Analysis. Mm -hmm. Administration is a historic uh, term and I think we need to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And that's why people don't even say Masters in Business Administration anymore. They just say MBA. <laughs> yes. uh, it's a bit like that KFC uh, phenomenon. You know, <laughs> we, they, they rebranded from Kentucky Fried Chicken to KFC. That's right. And the MBA also has rebranded. Yeah. Uh, we only say MBA. In fact, I haven't heard Masters in Business Administration for years. <laughs> uh, so, so uh, yes, we have to think th through new frameworks. Right. Innovation, 
growing at a rapid uh, rate at the moment. Moore's law is taking us and, and going like that. We need to change much faster. So normal processes cannot cope with the future because the future is growing like that and the, the delta is too much. How do you as a businessman, as a thought leader, as a mentor, advise people and companies to find a way to bridge that delta? Information is hitting us at a tremendous pace in time. A uh, tremendous pace. I mean, it is uh, uh, n never ever in the history of the world have we been hit by so much information. And the danger with being hit by so much information is that you don't pay attention to any of it. Yeah. So, you know, to answer the first part of your question, as, as someone who's entering the, jo the, the, the job world um, and entering and, be and beginning their career, I would say focus on a few key elements every morning in terms of readings. Mm -hmm. For instance, I mean, I'll speak about my personal example. I start every morning uh, in terms of my reading by reading the local newspaper, the New York Times, and the Financial Times. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is not, you know, article by article. It, it's, a, it's a glance through, you pick up on articles that you, that you like. Are you doing this online? I'm doing it online. Okay. I'm doing it on my iPad. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm reading all of these three newspapers. Um, now, will this, uh, you know, can I keep up with, the, with, with, you know, with Moore's Law? No. Just by reading three newspapers, I can't. Yeah. But it's also uh, about ensuring that you are continuously learning in a formal manner with discipline. Mm -hmm. uh, and really the key is discipline. Uh, in terms of organizations, you know, trying to keep up with Moore's law, uh, it's again about culture, I would say. The culture that runs through the organization should not be top heavy. It should be an organization that has that serving model that we, you know, that, that, that Gandhi made so popular in, yeah. the, in, in, the, in the early part of the century. My thesis that I work with regularly is that 10% growth in the future, you are effectively dead because of the rate of growth through Moore's law. So 10% is not going to survive. You need to think 10x, mm -hmm. 10 times. So every company needs to sort of think 10 times growth. How do I, if I'm a $100 million company, how do I become a billion dollar company is the thought process rather than I'll grow 10%. How do you do 10x thinking? So firstly, I think it is important to do 10x thinking, but one also has to be careful. Because we today are in, in a global environment with a few exceptions of low economic growth, and in some cases, no economic growth. So we have to be careful in trying to think 10x in an environment that doesn't support that, at least for the time being. Now, the world's not going to remain like this. Sure. Uh, there are going to be disruptions, and you have to be there in order to take advantage of them and think 10x. But you have to wait till those opportunities come. Uh, you have to actively seek the opportunities as well. Um, so in terms of 10x thinking, firstly, I would say do not restrict. I, I, at least, you know, I'm talking about myself. I don't restrict myself by industry. Today, I, I oversee businesses uh, in the air conditioning space, in the uh, waterproofing space, in the uh, contracting space, in the service space, uh, in the technology space. And now, of course, I'm, o I'm overseeing this wonderful school, uh, which is all about giving back. And, you know, I even, we don't even call it a business. Uh, in fact, uh, our, our talk at the management level is education can never be a business. But in terms of 10x thinking, don't restrict yourself to one particular industry. Think broad. Continuously learn. And only you know what, how you learn best. Could be in a formal environment, could be in an informal environment, could be through pic uh, pictures, mm -hmm. could be through writing, could be through poetry. Try and, try and analyze yourself and try and reflect uh, at least that's what I do. You know, how do how do I learn best? Sure. So now we've done your almost your full story, uh, full circle, and back to today. We started with today. We're back to today. How do you see? Let's imagine that today is your hundredth birthday. 
And we've come here to celebrate your 100th birthday. You have more than half your life uh, to, uh, to live. What are we celebrating? What has Naveen achieved in the previous 50 odd years? So if someone was reading my e eulogy, you know, at the age of, by the time I'm 100, yes. and, uh, or writing it, yeah. the first thing I'd at least like to hear is that Naveen was a cool dad. Okay. <laughs> that's cool. That's, that's very, very important to me. Sure. Uh, a loving husband, a, a great son, uh, and a, uh, a caring brother. I think uh, these are the four areas that matter to me more than anything else. In terms of my professional side, mm -hmm. uh, I, would, I, I would like to hear that uh, Naveen was someone who served. Uh, for me, a serving role is extremely important. Uh, and he led by serving. Uh, and really, that's, that to me would be a life uh, that is very fulfill, uh, fulfilling. You have an amazing platform for learning and education. Would you, and you are a financially thinking person or numbers thinking person, have you given yourself a distinct KPI that I will reach a thousand children and help a thousand kids in a year, a million in two years, 10 million in five years, 100 million in 10 years, and by the time I'm 100, I would like to have reached a billion kids through my educational learning platform. And I give myself a target of a billion, and then I get there. In the next five years, uh, in the city of Dubai, we want to be imparting an education to 5,000 children. Uh, that is our immediate uh, near-term goal, that in five years, 5,000 children should be experiencing an Arcadia education. In terms of going beyond that and truly looking at scale beyond that, we are exploring technology platforms that will allow us to scale up this Arcadia ethos. Uh, and for us, uh, it is about touching the lives of those that are not fortunate enough to have a uh, formal education or, no, or to be in a formal educational setting. And that could be in the interiors of villages in South Asia. Uh, it could be in the remote uh, towns of Africa. Uh, and really the internet for us mm -hmm. is, is a huge, huge tool there. Uh, so, so for us, it's going to be about making that play and having a platform which we, are, we should be allowed to scale up. And, you know, you talk about a million or a billion children. It's really not about the numbers. Even if one makes the difference in the life of one child, mm -hmm. it is so impactful. And that's why I truly love parents because every day they go back and they give unconditional love to their children. Uh, and what, you know, I don't think there is a more beautiful relationship in this world than that between a parent and a child. Absolutely. In this expansion to the world through technology, through the internet, um, through your learning methodologies and so on, technology is enabling us to bridge the young people, and you spoke about the older, the aging population, the 35 years of uh, post-retirement time. Do you have a vision, perhaps, that in the future a 10-year-old child from the Arcadia School will be doing joint research with somebody in Bolivia or somebody in Bangladesh, sitting here doing developmental projects where the older 75-year-old is mentoring and the 10-year-old is reverse mentoring and talking about the fresh new things, giving both of those sides a new lease of life. Oh, yes, and I think it's already happening. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, my father just yesterday was, uh, was mentioning to a, a relatively small audience that reverse mentoring should replace traditional mentoring. <laughs> yes. For, uh, you know, he's uh, 76 years old, God bless him and give him a long life. And he was saying that it's important for everyone of his age and pretty much everyone uh, who crosses the age of, of 50 mm -hmm. to have a mentor that is 30 years, minimum 30 years younger. Indeed. 
And uh, for someone like me who's 45, uh, you know, if I go by the 30-year formula, I should have a 15-year-old mentor. Mm -hmm. And that could be my own son. Yes. It's amazing what we can learn from our own children. That's true. Uh, and keep you young. Yeah, I mean, my younger son, uh, he, he, he's constantly a sounding board for me. Mm -hmm. He gives me some of my best ideas. Mm -hmm. uh, and they happen on the dinner table. Yeah. Uh, I was talking to a, a, a top telecoms group, and uh, I said that the average age of a strategic chairman or board is around 60. The average operating manager and a frontline leader is around 40, and the average consumer is around 20. So you have these three generations, and the 62-year-old is making a decision for the 21-year-old. True. How do you bridge that, and what advice would you give to the board in terms of looking at the young person, or looking at his target audience, basically? I think it's important, firstly, to not define one's thinking by age. Age is just a number. Sure. Uh, today, our, uh, you know, my father, and I keep coming back to my father, at 76, his thinking is younger than many of my peers. Mm -hmm. His use of technology is greater than many of my peers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think it's important to have a, a, a willingness to adopt new skills regardless of where you are in your, in your life, in your life. The advice that I give, I'll get, you're the expert, I'm just the guy who's <laughs> no, talking. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, the advice I give, uh, we spoke on one of them. Uh, if you are a 65-year-old chairman of a board, the first thing you need is get a reverse mentor, um, which we discussed. Uh, the second thing you need to do is go completely out of your comfort zone, write poetry, paint, do something, but do it methodically and do it like literally a one week program on art. With discipline. You with, know, discipline. with discipline. With yeah. discipline. Yeah. But you go out there and you're saying, okay, I'm going to be in this little playground and I'm going to paint for the next one week because True. I want to start connecting with my creative juices. True. Uh, and the third one, which my Harvard professor, I'm an HBS alum, my Harvard prof professor on, uh, on the digital marketing side, he said something very interesting to me. He said, the 65-year-old needs to have a one-week program on coding, on learning how algorithms work. Because then suddenly their mind goes into the young thinker, the kid who's doing Snapchat, the kid who's coming up with a new app. How do the algorithms work? And those were the three pieces of advice that if I was asking myself this question is what I would give. Thoughts, I th comments? <laughs> I think uh, your, your Harvard professor is spot on <laughs> yes. uh, with, the, with the algorithms. Poetry, art, music. Yes, music, absolutely. Um, these, are, these are very, very important areas of life. I think a life without poetry or without music or without art is a life that's not worth living. And to truly experience the essence of this, one should try and participate. Mm -hmm. And whether that means, and participation can be your own personal connection mm -hmm. with the field. Mm -hmm. I mean, it could be something as simple as listening to some music, and it could be any type of music before you go to bed at night, or penning a poem mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, uh, not necessarily uh, to, uh, to yourself, but it could be to a loved one. Uh, uh, in the evening or waking up in the morning and uh, and painting mm -hmm. and just throwing some colors onto a canvas sure. uh, these are such beautiful moments in life uh, that one really um, uh, a life without it is again a life yeah. not worth living so if you look at the next decade at a time and just getting towards the end of this of this conversation and this of your life story I, I, I leapt into the, the hundred uh, year, year sort of birthdays, but I think probably um, I, we'll edit this out. But my, my thinking was that you know Matsushita, who wrote, who created the National Panasonic. Of course. Uh, at six, sixty, he retired from work, but he became a teacher. At seventy, he became a, a, a philanthropist. At eighty, he became a poet, and at ninety, uh, he became an artist. And, and 
at, when I was at business school, we were given a poem to read, um, and uh, it was a poem about love. And, and uh, John Cotter, Professor John Cotter, was our professor who asked us to um, tell us, read it overnight, think about it, and tell us our analysis of that. And the key question was, how old do you think the person was who wrote this poem? And bar none, everybody was youthful, young, not, nobody went beyond the age of 40. He was 87 when he wrote that poem. So he had youthfulness in his life. If you live your life in 10-year chunks from now, do you feel that you would need to keep reinventing yourself every 10 years? Or do you feel that you're a nice, smooth curve and you'll be able to live to 100 in, in an incremental way? No, I think the, uh, the idea of reinventing yourself instinctively appeals to me. Right. You know, I mentioned to you that I'm going uh, and doing another ma master's, this yes. time in the education field. Yes. Uh, I hope to start that uh, in 2017. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it's important to constantly educate yourself. You know, you mentioned uh, Matsushita when it came to him being a teacher yes. uh, after once he hit the age of 60. And I think instinctively, mm -hmm. I'm drawn towards teaching. So it, it naturally appeals to me, and sure. that will be my way of giving back. Now, where that journey takes me, mm -hmm. only time will tell. But I could see that you know, once I go from 60 to 70, mm -hmm. uh, it would, you know, I'd be looking at a much bigger uh, space uh, in terms of uh, you know, giving back to the world. And that could happen very much happen through poetry. Mm -hmm. uh, through writing poems, so I can totally, totally relate to this this man, uh, and and the life that he, uh, you know, that he's led, and and it, it's it's uh, it, it seems he's a very very happy uh, he's led a very happy life. Indeed. Anything that I may have missed that you'd like to share with us? Any comment? Any remark? Any observation? I'd like to. Um, to end with just a, a thank you, uh, a thank you to you. Uh, you know, this is my second time that I, that I've had the good fortune of, of interacting with you on in this type of uh, environment. I'd also like to uh, point out uh, Rabia Ataya, uh, the CEO of Bait. He is a very, very dear friend, uh, someone I, who I've been with uh, for uh, 20 years now. And I've seen him transform and constantly reinvent himself. Uh, uh, and he's just such a source of inspiration. I, I, want, you know, I want to give a special thank you to him. Naveen, it's been a real privilege, real honor, and a genuine, genuine pleasure. Uh, I'm saying this with entire humility. Whenever I see you I, and whenever I talk to you, I find it uh, fascinating and inspirational because in a very quiet, humble way, you have managed to achieve so much and you inspire a lot of young people and people like myself. I'm deeply, deeply grateful. Thank you for that. Thank you for inviting us here and I would love to see these young kids blossom and uh, they're these little caterpillars and there'll be these vibrant, beautiful, colorful butterflies in the future and you'll be helping to sort of facilitate this process. So you're doing a wonderful job and you're building lives and changing the world. Thank you very much. Indeed. You're welcome. Thank you very, very much. Thank, Thank you. you.